Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. We, unaccustomed to courage, exiles from delight, live coiled in shells of loneliness. Until love leaves its high holy temple and comes into our sight to liberate us into life. Love arrives, and in its train come ecstasies, old memories of pleasure, ancient histories of pain. Yet, if we are bold, love strikes away the chains of fear from our souls. We are weaned from our timidity. In the flush of love's light, we dare be brave. And suddenly, we see that love costs all we are and will ever be. Yet, it is only love which sets us free. It's a Maya Angelou poem that you may have heard before. I think it's touched by an angel. It is love that sets us free. We've been talking in these days about a courageous kind of approach to life. We've said that it's living with faith in fearful times. Speaking of courage, I want to know how many of you this summer uh, went on a vacation with your family? Anybody? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you went on a vacation in, in your car, like you rode for a while? How many of you, let's say over three hours, you're in the car with your family? All right, now let's, let's talk courage. How many of you, how many of you were on a, you were on a trip for more than five hours in the car? Anybody? All right, wow. How about more than 10? Wow. More than 15? Anybody? Okay. How many of you really fearless parents um, actually went on an airplane? with your family on a trip this summer. Okay, outstanding. You know, what happens is um, it just kind of gets tough, doesn't it, sometimes? When Stacy and I were newlyweds, we were a lean, mean, traveling machine. We could travel all over the nation and literally did with family, extended family. And then we had twins. And then we had another and suddenly, traveling of any kind became really, really tough. Uh, partly because the direct ratio between the size of your child, really how small your child is, and how much stuff then you have to take. Some of you parents came in this morning, the preschool area. You had like a backpack. You had diapers, extra pacifiers. You, you know, had a, I don't know, survival kit, um, generator. You had a tent. I don't know. But... You're coming in. It's like you're moving in here at the church. The smaller your child, it seems that way. I remember when I was a kid, um, we had we went on family trips. Had two brothers, and we didn't always get along. And um, we had a station wagon. anybody anybody have a station wagon? When you, I know some of your students are going. Our pastor was in a wagon. <laughs> yeah, is back when the colonies were being formed. You know, back east. Um, yeah, we were in a station wagon. We had the kind that. Um, the back would fold down so you could put everything in the back. Or if you, you know, didn't have as much luggage, you could raise the seats and you would look back. Anybody have that? Anybody here? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. And now, I don't think you can do that today. How dangerous is that? But we're, we would travel looking back, kids, I'm telling you. And it was the most awkward thing. Somebody come up, drive up behind you or at a stoplight. <laughs> you didn't know where to look. It was really awkward <laughs> steering people. And... Um, but we would go on trips, and I remember where we'd load up the back, and we'd be all up front, and, and you know, we're arguing over 
you know, this is my space. And we'd argue over you know, the radio station. And again, I know students like, radio station? <laughs> Who listens to radio station? But I remember one time we were up front and pushing buttons, and my dad's trying to hold us back. And by the way, that was also the seatbelt back in the day, wasn't it? You know, <laughs> all right. Um, but we're fighting over the radio, and my dad's trying to keep us from, you know, killing each other. And he goes off the road. We hit a telephone pole. Yeah, he was not happy. That was not good. Uh, but I remember, you know, how, how difficult it was when I was a little kid. And then I became a parent, right? And inevitably, someone is sitting too close to somebody else. Somebody wants, again, a certain, you know, kind of music. Or it's too hot. Or they're touching me with their feet. And we have preferences about where to eat and when to stop and when not to stop. And the temperature's not just right. And then... Uh, I became a pastor. <laughs> and, and you know this, do you not? That one of the most prominent descriptors, a word picture in the Bible that we see that describes the church is a family on a journey together. A family on a trip, on the move, going somewhere, not on a vacation mind you, but moving with purpose and to a destination. And today what I want to talk about on this Vision Sunday, I thought it would be a good thing to remind us that we're a family together and we are moving towards a common destination. Our destination is Jesus and we get to do this together. In fact, Paul speaks of this in Ephesians 4. I realize we're crossing metaphors here a little bit, but you can see on the screen, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so it builds itself up. The family of God growing, building itself up. In Ephesians 2, he says it this way. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. The household of God. We're members of his family. Ephesians 1, 5 says this. God's unchanging plan has been from the very beginning to adopt us into his family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. Hebrews 2.10, I could go on and on. It says he wanted to have many children to share his glory. John 13, Jesus gave us a new commandment. We read it earlier, or Sam read it for us. Love each other just as Christ has loved us. And then we prove that we're in his family, that we belong to him. You know, on this, the 15th anniversary of 9-11, it's ironic, isn't it, that the central focus this weekend, this NFL Sunday, will be on certain ones who will not stand in honor of our flag during the national anthem. It's caused me to think on this anniversary, what happened? What's happened over these past 15 years? And much has happened. But I find it ironic that on a day that once united us, you remember 9-11, people flooded our churches. We were more patriotic and united than many, many would say even after World War II. It was an incredible time. And some of you remember it well. And we were united because we were all Americans first, above all else. We had something that united us. We all felt the same. Do you remember that? We all felt the same, and we all rose up to help each other. We all hugged each other a little more. We went home that night and hugged and loved our family more. We were united by something bigger than anything that could divide us as a nation. You know, when a nation decides that it's not united, around a common purpose and a common goal and our great ideal of freedom. That's the death of a nation. 
And when a church is not united around what matters the most and what trumps all things other than Christ himself, that's the death of a church. And so today I want to remind us that we are united in Christ. He is our focus. And I want to remind us that it is, that it is He that we worship. And I want to talk about what this unity looks like in practice. All right? So I want you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Would you do that? I thought it would be a great day to get back to the church that Jesus envisioned us to be. Acts chapter 2, many of you will know this is a snapshot of the church. I want to talk to you about the church as family. Do you ever stop and think, I had a fascinating conversation with one of our members this week about this question. I don't know if you do this. I do it all the time as a pastor. I ask the question, is this really what Jesus had in mind? I mean, is this the church as we know it today? Is this really what he envisioned the church to be? This is the question we should always ask. This past week, I read an article in the New York Times And it asks this question, the title of the article, What Religion Would Jesus Belong To? It's kind of a provocative way of asking who or or how would he recognize his church today? In what way would he recognize his church today? Now that may seem like a rather extreme statement, but I want us to get back today to the church that Jesus envisioned. We see it in the book of Acts, chapter 2. In verse 41, it says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day 3,000 souls. Now today, after our last service, we're going to baptize over 50 souls, and you'll be there, I hope, to come and join us. We're going to have a great, great time. Verse 42, look at this. And they devoted themselves. Now this word in the Greek is proskartereo. We've talked about this before. Uh, This means passionately committed to. I want us to all consider ourselves individually and, yes, corporately. Are we passionately devoted to the things that the early church was devoted to? Look at this. They they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. That word is koinonia. It's a a Christ-like love for one another. To the breaking of bread and the prayers. Many have noted that that breaking of bread, yes, bread together is a gathering together, but many have said that that that's, could be communion. It's worship together as well. Clearly throughout, there's this commitment to gathering together. Notice that, that it says the prayers. They were intentional about their prayer. Verse 43, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the the proceeds to all as any had needs. See, they were caring for each other. And day after day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want you to see this. They devoted themselves to first the word of God. A healthy church will be marked by a family, a people who are drawn to the word of God, the apostles' teaching, the the Bible guides us in all things. They devoted themselves to one another. They were committed to love each other and forgive each other. And even when they had disagreements, they would resolve those things and extend grace to each other. Paul would say it in Philippians, to prefer one another with a koinonia, a passionate devotion to each other. It's throughout this passage. And they'd worship together. They would gather together. They would commit themselves to coming together because they knew how critical it was that they needed each other. They needed to exalt Christ as Lord and be reminded of who is Lord of all, Lord of their lives. And then to prayer. It says prayers. Again, they intentionally came together on all occasions, and the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. I want you to see right now folks who joined our church in recent days. uh, They've come to be a part of our church. Some of you are in, in this room right now. And we're a better church because of you. And the Lord's gonna add to our number daily 
Not just on Sunday, but those who come as we share the gospel. You see, a gospel-centered church is not simply a church where the pastor or the teachers proclaim the gospel, but where every member is sharing the gospel with friends, co-workers, neighbors. But I want you to welcome these folks into our church family. And if you'll do so, we'll do it now. Will you say amen? Yes. We're so grateful that the Lord continues to add to our number daily those who are being saved. We've had an incredible, uh, incredible weeks of folks joining our church. And this is such a critical time. But listen, we've talked a bit lately about being fearless and being bold in our witness to be salt and light in the world. And here's the truth. You don't experience persecution for being a Christian. Not really. You experience persecution for being a witnessing Christian. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Timothy 3, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We've talked about this recently. It's because we're different. And again, as we share the gospel, we take on the mantle of making disciples and sharing with our friends. So as we're marked by the word of God, by loving and forgiving one another, worshiping together, by praying together, humbling ourselves before the Lord. We grow up in Him together. And we get to do this together. And we're heading to a destination as a family. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. His Spirit is at work in us. And we are all, we have a single destination. Our journey is always to Jesus. And as we focus on Him, we bring one another along. The key to love is to be loved by Him. I've said it this way, to behold Him and to be held by Him. This is what we encourage one another to do. I want you to see a graph up here. I've got an X, Y kind of axis. I want you to see, because I thought it would be helpful, particularly those of us, like me, who are kind of visual learners. I want you to look at this, and I'm going to walk us through it. You can see on the, really on the Y graph, um, as you go uh, vertically, it's a person who's more relational, living in community. Think of it that way, as opposed to a person who is not living in the community of a local church or, or group. And then as you go to the left, the person is more focused on themselves instead of serving others, all right? You see how that works? So look at this, and I want you to see the kind of church that we are, the kind of church, a biblically functioning community uh, lands in a certain quadrant. You can probably guess. We're going to start at Us for Us. That quadrant is an inwardly focused church or group. I want you to think about your own connect group or maybe a small group trying to grow spiritually well-intentioned, but rarely inviting others to come and be a part of the group. They're, they're relationally connected, but they're inwardly focused. We are prone to do this, friends, and we need to be honest about how that happens in groups that we find ourselves in. Is your connect group outwardly focused? It's a great challenge for our leaders. And then the next part you can see there, the you for me. This is the, the consumer, the cultural Christian, when we approach church with this kind of mindset, we see the church and even our smaller group as existing for me, right? It's you for me. You're here for me. And there certainly is that in the church, that we're here for each other and we serve each other. But this mindset, gone too far, is that the pastor and the church and the leaders of the church, they exist for me. And this is a very dangerous thing. It happens in worship. When worship attenders never move beyond a, a real focus on themselves. And we do this. It's such an insidious thing. We all do it in varying degrees. So worship becomes frustrating and self-focused in its experience because instead of offering our lives to God and joining the body of Christ, uh, we're never quite satisfied because the music, preaching, the the programs don't meet my needs and my preferences. The Lord never 
wants us to worship that way. What an unsatisfying way to worship. We've said it before. There are really two types of worship. It's acceptable or unacceptable. And only you can determine that for yourself. You can't determine that for others. Not really. So then there's the me for them. This is an individual chasing a cause. Now we see this a lot in our day. These are folks who kind of establish their own ministry. And these are all really good things. They're blogging about something they're passionate about. And those are all great things. And many people are doing things even outside of the local church, if you will. But sometimes trying to do it alone. And in, in not in the context of community. They often burn themselves out in isolation without healthy community. We forget that it's God himself who's reconciling all things to himself. And we do it without the local church. And if you're here today and you are not a member of our church, of course, I would encourage you to join today. I would encourage you to join a local church if you're not here in the Dallas area. Perhaps there's another. But find the local church and get involved. It's not me for them. Here's where this lands. It's us for them. This is the church that gathers and then scatters. I believe this is the church described in the book of Acts that we looked at. This is our church with a strong sense of community, but also a strong sense of common purpose. We gather because we need each other, and we scatter to be the church he's called us to be. We're relationally connected, but we're united with a purpose that extends into our community and into our city and around the world. So you see there's a tension. I don't want to speak to this in in our church today. There's a tension within the church between caring for one another, engaging and engaging those outside of the church. You feel it, do you not? You feel it in your your own life. I said to our staff just recently, there are tensions to manage. There's problems to fix. There are problems to solve, but there are tensions to manage. And in a church like ours, it's important for all of us to understand We must be united as a church, and it's not unity around a certain program. It's not unity around a specific group or age or style of music or form or individual preference. It's 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 unified around Christ and Him alone, where what's core is Christ and the gospel, and everything else is non-core and open for change. Our unique mission in our local context, we've said it this way. In fact, here it is. Let's say it together. We, we exist by, to make disciples by the glory of God. Here it is. By rescuing one another from cultural Christianity to follow Jesus every day. Now, that's a very unique challenge for us. Cultural Christianity is the problem behind the declining church in America. Cultural Christians identify themselves uh, as or with a Christian culture, probably from, and, and most often from a, a background, some kind of identification that's related to personal experience or just kind of a social or cultural context. But they're not following Jesus every day. I've said it before, it's possible to go to church every week and fewer and fewer of us are committed to the local church on a weekly basis. Possible to, 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 to not go to church every week and not follow Jesus every day. It's possible to come to church weekly and not follow Jesus every day. We've been called to make disciples. And so what I want us to think of today is this. We're here to rescue. Yes, Christ alone can rescue. And we're here to draw others to him. And we're here to help others, each other grow in him and then share his love with others. You know, Christianity is a terrible hobby. He's called us to make him preeminent in our lives. Is he a part of your life or is he preeminent in your life? Is he a focus in your life or is he first place in your life? This is the great challenge in North Dallas. And I'm believing that God is calling us as a church to to have Lord uh, Christ as Lord of our lives. And for each of us to live with him as Lord of our lives, this will be our witness. This will be what others will see in us, our friends, our classmates. So it's not, you can see, us 
for us. It's not you for me. It's not me for them. It's us for them. We take the gospel to others. Now, I want to do this. I want to remind you of those values that drive us today. Just getting back to the, the basics on this Vision Sunday. It, it, it's, it's, the values are those things that drive us, that motivate us in everything we do. First, there's the boundless gospel. This is without uh, end, and it touches every aspect of our lives. Inexhaustible grace is the next one. This has to do with more how we relate to one another. The same grace that we've extended, we extend to each other. And then there's this overflowing generosity. The, the gospel drives us to give everything that we have to him. We respond to his great love by giving our time, our gifts to others. We share our resources. And we give back to praise uh, to him. And then there's this courageous innovation, which is so important in our church that leads us to new ways to reach more and more people, to be more effective in our mission, and specifically as it relates to this next generation, to reach them, the next generation of leaders, believers among us and in our city. And then there's this relentless urgency that drives us because we know that night cometh and we know that we're in a moment, a cultural moment, a critical moment in our nation, in our church, and in our city. You might say, well, how do we do this? And some of you are guests today, and I want you to be real clear about how we specifically accomplish this mission among us. We say that we're going to worship weekly. Commit your life to being here. It's critical in the life of a believer. We're going to connect weekly with one another through our Sunday morning groups that prepare children and youth and adults to serve and to multiply. Our training also includes Wednesday nights. Maybe you know, you've seen that we've had over a 1,000 people uh, here on Wednesday nights in recent days. It's been incredible, and each week our numbers have increased. I thought it'd be good for us just to pause for a moment and to celebrate together what God is doing. I want you to watch this. great that's so exciting hey if you're not yet a part of wednesday night we just wanted you to be encouraged to be here and be a part of what god's doing so we connect weekly in multiple ways but we serve regularly inside and outside the church okay as we continue to kind of get all of our hearts set on what god is doing and unified around our mission we're just serving others this happens through our 1-8 initiatives here and beyond. We've had over 350 people who've gone on mission trips this past year, and we must continue. This is what marks our church, our 1-8 initiatives here and around the world. It starts here. It starts here on our campus every Sunday morning. Every day there are 500 people moving to Dallas-Fort Worth area. 70% of them are foreign-born. What does this mean for us as a church, and how will we meet the needs in these days? Well, we wonder, how do we know if we're successful 
in all of this? What really matters to God? So we've said our measures, the ultimate measure of any church that Jesus envisioned is how we are making disciples who make disciples. That's the purpose of the church. Not simply to have programs. And I want you to be, be clear. What you see here on Wednesday nights and what we do on Sunday mornings is to raise up, make disciples, everything we do. Whether we're singing, teaching children how to sing, whether we're looking at the Word of God and memorizing His Word, it's to raise up disciples. So the questions we ask, you, you hear them if you're a member here, irreducible questions of a disciple. First, what is God saying? We look at His Word, and by His Spirit, He speaks to us. Secondly, how will I obey? Because not until I obey do I really unlock the power of God in my life. It's not about knowledge, we say. Who will I tell in order to encourage them in the Lord to follow Jesus every day? This is our mission as we seek to be part of the Great Commission. But friends, we'll never reach our fullest redemptive potential until each of us realize that we are united in Christ and all that we do in our church is set on Him. We're fixed on Him. So we've said there's healthy tensions in a church like ours. People from varied backgrounds and multiple generations, multiple venues, languages. And yet we've said, you know, we're going to love each other. We don't want to fix that. We want to live in that tension. And it's grace that holds us together. So I want to say this as I kind of land this challenge today. The way forward is both and, not either or. It's the genius of the and. We have the opportunity to practice and model a both and approach to life and ministry in a wonderfully diverse church like ours. But it takes incredible amounts of grace takes incredible amounts of, of love and patience, hearts set on the mission of Jesus above all else. Listen, our nation is so polarized right now. Again, to think on this 15th anniversary of 9-11, that we find ourselves so divided, and we as a church have the opportunity to live this Acts 2 kind of biblically functioning community, to show the world what it is to love each other, you know, when you look at Acts 2, you see that the early church, they heard things they'd never heard before. They saw things they had never seen from Pentecost on. And it's true today. God's doing a new thing. Because we hold on too often to our forms and to our own preferences and styles and programs until they become idols. And God says, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm going to do it, and it's going to start in your heart. And so, friends, I want you to know we've decided as a church we're not going to copy others. We're going to seek God, and we're going to be the church he's called us to be. We're going to hear from him, and we're going to do what he says. We're going to say what he says. We need to preserve the core, and we need to stimulate progress. We need to stop looking at others. Stop looking back at the old thing and look forward to the new thing. Isaiah 43, verse 19, Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And listen, the new thing has much less to do with forms and styles and all those things that we talk about that could easily divide us, but they do not. Because it has more to do with the hearts of His people. The new thing is not simply the old thing in a younger body. He's already done the old thing. He's doing a new thing. And this new thing, do you not perceive it? It's by the Spirit's work. You see it in Mark chapter 4, verse 12. They may indeed see, but not perceive. And may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. It's not the next thing. It's a new thing. It's not a facelift on the old thing. It's, it's a new thing. And God says, you're going to have to wrestle with me, church, if you're going to figure out what the new thing is. And he's doing a new thing among us. Do you not perceive it? God is doing a great thing. Listen, when you have forgotten in your own personal life that God is faithful and sovereign over you, if you've, you think you've been forgotten, you get ready. He's doing a new thing. He's preparing you for something more. He's always at work. We don't need 
more gifted leaders. We need more anointed leaders. And anointing comes by the Spirit of God. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what the prophet Isaiah is saying. It's the Spirit of God upon our lives. It's not about me. It's not even ultimately about us. It's about Jesus. It's us for them. The new thing is both and. It's big and small. It's old and young. It's fresh and mature. It's contemporary and traditional. It's English and Espanol. It's budgets and faith. It's planning and praying. It's working and resting. It's Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. He's doing a new thing, and the new thing will eclipse the old thing. We're so often prone to look back at a latter glory, but I love what Haggai 2.9 says, the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And this place, in this place, I will bring peace, says the Lord of hosts. And out of that peace, that unity of hearts and minds, we're going to see him do something we've never seen. We're going to behold something we've never known. And it's time. It's time for us to be the church that Christ envisioned us to be. Because night cometh, life is short. Let's be the church he's called us to be. So we are a loving family with Christ our head leading the way. And you see in your bulletin today, uh, I hope you've grabbed one. If you haven't, you need to because today we have a special magnet in there for you. You can see really, really kind of a four to six month horizon as to where we're heading. We wanted you to mark your calendar. I've been told that October 15th men's breakfast with Concord is actually the 22nd. But we'll be promoting that. You'll hear more about that. But you can look and see as we head into the fall and even into next year the great things that are happening. We're going to come together this fall. It just happens this way. Um, we're going to come together as a church about once a month, we've got a homecoming uh, time coming together. We have lunch on the lawn. Uh, we're going to have a couple of other uh, times. Uh, Oz Guinness is going to be here in November, one of the leading apologists in the world today. will come and share with us. So we thought it would be fun to come together as a church. Otherwise, we're worshiping in, uh, across the campus. Friends, we are a family on a journey. And we're called to love and forgive and serve one another. And as we love each other, as the watching world sees how we grace one another, they're going to want to get in on it. And they're going to wonder, what is it that drives us? Not all roads lead to the same destination. You know that. Our destination is Christ. He's our focus, and He's where we're heading. Every one of us. He is the one we exalt. He's the one we worship. It's his mission that we join. But if you're here today and you've never received Christ, I want to encourage you today. I want to challenge you. You know that not all roads lead to the same God. I should say, I suppose I could say it this way, all roads do lead to God. But the Bible says that it is appointed for every person to die once and then face judgment before this holy God. And that judgment is simply based on whether or not you've received the grace of Christ. He alone has died on the cross for your sin. He alone is Lord of all. If you've not given your heart to him, he's your only rescue. And I pray today will be your day. Church family, we are a family on a journey. And Christ himself is our destination and praise be to God we get to do this together we get to love one another and love our friends and love our neighbors into the family of God it's been his purpose all along for this great church and we have great days before us guests friends come come join us on this journey this amazing purpose filled life that he's called us to. Join us even today as we seek to worship our Lord with our lives. Let's let's pray together. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? 
Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the vision you've given us as a church. I thank you for the collective potential that you've brought here in this place. And you've done it. You have done this great thing. And how amazing it is that you would choose to bring these people, thousands of people together. It must be that you have such a great future for us. Lord, I thank you for this loving church family. I thank you for the privilege of serving here as the shepherd of this wonderful flock. And God, I pray that you would continue to draw more and more to yourself through us. And even today, for those who need to follow you, to receive your grace, thank you for dying on the cross for our sin. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us your spirit. And thank you for the joy of baptism and transformed lives. May we be the church you've called us to be as each of us does our part and fulfills the calling you've placed on our lives. We love you. We give you our lives. In Christ's name, amen.